We are back. Road to the Derby. We're actually on to the Preakness now. Andrew Capone, who's got the action. Caleb Knight taking a stand. Uh, Caleb, I have to ask you, bombs away. I mean, we did really well. If you look at our, our top selections, we had second, third, fourth, <laughs> and fifth. So we were close there, but uh, I don't think I could have predicted the rich strike. Uh, how'd you feel coming out of that race? Yeah, I guess I felt uh, as good as you can when you get you know nailed at the wire by a, whatever it was, an 80 to one long shot that wasn't even supposed to be in the field. But no, I thought Rich Strike ran an awesome race. I mean, take nothing away from him. He needed everything to go right, and for him it did. Got a good ride, got a just wicked pace up front, and he was able to get the job done. Uh, wasn't on many of my tickets. I thought Epicenter ran a big race. That was kind of my key to the weekend. So a little uh, disappointed that didn't work out when I thought he probably ran the best race of anyone in that field. But that's why it's 20 horses running around in a circle. Crazy things happen. Yeah, I mean, we we dropped our uh, our film on that. Uh, I believe it was that Wednesday, Wednesday morning. Uh, we were on Horse Racing Nation on YouTube, and the horse wasn't even in the race then. So, in our defense, we couldn't even handicap it. It wasn't even there yet. So, uh, we no harm, no foul. Uh, I think we did a good job on that race. It just uh, you can't predict those eighty to ones coming in like that. So we're going to move down to Pimlico for this weekend. Preakness, Rich Strike not running. Um, got a nice little race here. We're going to go one through nine through our, all the horses. And then we're going to talk about our bets and uh, a little bit of that Black Eyed Susan Preakness Daily Double, which seems like the, the only pool people are, from my understanding, are very interested in jumping into for that two-day there. Uh, one and three sixteenth down at Baltimore. Nine runners, 7 p.m. post. Should be a fun one. More of a party than necessarily a horse race, in my opinion. But, hey, we'll, uh, we'll see how it turns out. Um, I'll start off with the number one, my boy Simplification. I mean, he gets a new pilot. I've been over this horse. I thought he ran a huge derby. JV takes them out as Jose steps off to ride early voting. Uh, nice finish fourth in the derby. Ran well in the derby. Wide, wide, wide. Um, got a nice call by Travis Stone. Made that middle move. And, you know, Travis really caught him good and, and got him going there. Um, just ran out of runway. He looked like he kept was going on. And, and the horse had a little bit of finish coming past the finish line. So I was happy about that. Has shown a diversity, as I've said in the past, running on the lead, stalking, closing. It's really come from anywhere to run some good races. 15th to 4th, it ran down uh, 15th to 4th in the Derby, ran a 115 on time form, which pretty good, but uh, did not take a step forward from its previous race in Florida Derby. Going to need to take a step forward here to keep up with everybody. Uh, draws the rail. That will hurt a little bit. Um, this track has been pretty dead on the rail. It's only been uh, a little over 10 days they've been running here, but pretty dead track. Um, so I, I definitely think he's going to have to save ground here. I still love the horse, uh, but this pace setup is going to be a little tough for him, I think. I'm going to use the horse underneath. Not going to be one uh, I'm going to necessarily be win betting this time. Uh, so let's look at the two here. Kurt Meister with uh, the supplement here. What would you think? I can't believe you're jumping off the simplification train. Finally, it's been a uh, it's been a good run for you with him, though. So I don't think you could be too upset by any of those results. So taking a look at number two, Creative Minister. This is a horse that I know a lot of folks are pretty interested in. I've heard a lot of conversation about him on Twitter and you know across a couple of other platforms, and I think it makes sense. This has been a hype horse pretty much ever since day one. He was working really strong in the mornings prior to his debut. It was a very well-publicized workout where he pretty obviously outworked Rattle and Roll going into the uh, Florida Derby, I think it was, or Fountain of Youth, one of those preps down in Florida. Um, you know, and Creative Minister was a big steam horse. And he's relatively lived up to the billing. I mean, he's shown up in every race. He, he just missed by a nick in this debut where he's probably left with a little bit too much to do. He came back and uh, tried two turns for the first time and was an impressive winner at Keeneland and then repeated that effort at Churchill two weeks ago on the Derby undercard. So Connections thought enough of this horse to supplement him, to enter him in the Preakness year since he was not initially Triple Crown nominated. I don't necessarily hate this horse, but I do feel like this is an awful lot to take on at this stage of his career. He's only making his fourth career start and he beat an allowance field that wasn't all that great, full of non winners of one type horses. And now he's going into a grade one in the Preakness on a two week turnaround, coming off of a, a pretty nice career top in that last race. To me, this is a horse that I think is going to take more money than I think his chances are relative to winning. Uh, he is kind of the new shooter, the new face, the relative unknown in this field. But for me, I think it's just a little bit too much too early. Uh, the quick turn back plus, you know, the big step up in class and stretching out another furlong to me leaves me with a little bit too many questions to settle on this horse at, a, you know, at the price I think he goes off at. 
I think that takes us to number three, Fenwick. So what do you think there, Andrew? Um, I don't know if there's much to think here necessarily. Uh, Flo takes the mountain here, and I hope he has a jet pack because I think this horse is puzzling. Seafood figs aren't even in the ballpark of what we'd look for here. Had one okay race down in Tampa uh, where he beat command performance. Horse doesn't have the pace figures to stay with the stalking group up front. Doesn't have the closing kick to stay back and make a run with the closers. Um, this horse, I, I don't want to spend more time on it than we have to. But, uh, but I'm definitely going to uh, just toss this horse right away. So let's take a look at the uh, Secret Oath here, the lady in the field. Yeah, I think Secret Oath is a really interesting player in this race. I've seen people saying, oh, she's not fast enough to run with the boys. And truthfully, I don't really understand where that sentiment comes from. Because on any set of figures that I've looked at, whether it's buyer or thoroughgraph or time form or anything else, she's competitive. I mean, she's not the fastest horse in the race necessarily, but she's extremely competitive with you know, other top choices in this field. So I think she has a great chance in here. She ran a great race in the Kentucky Oaks. I think people were uh, a little bit afraid maybe off that Arkansas Derby if she was starting to go the wrong way, but she really showed up in the Kentucky Oaks. She got a good pace to run at, which certainly helped her uh, run style, but it isn't like she was coming from the clouds. She was always within three or four lengths at the second call, she was already up within a length of the leaders and she just kind of looped around the field and went along her merry way. Just super, super impressive. I've always thought she has just an unbelievable turn of foot. Even back in that Arkansas Derby race, she loops the field and goes from last to second in about you know 10 or 12 strides. So she's just incredibly efficient. I think she's a really, really talented filly. This is a tougher spot than you know the Arkansas Derby was and she did have some trouble in that race. So I do think it's you know fair to wonder. I mean, how much money will she take being the girls again, the girl against the boys in here, and the other storylines that she's coming along with? But for my money, I mean, I think she's a very legitimate contender and the horse that I'm very interested in betting in this race. Another uh, major player here, I think, is early voting. So any love for early voting? Yeah, I mean, this. Uh, we'll, I'll talk about my picks later, but this is definitely probably this is my top pick for the race. Uh, early voting comes from New York. Um, Skip the Derby after the wood to point here directly. Um, Jose retains the mount. And the pace in this field should be out front, free and clear, in my opinion. Um, got a little pressure in the wood. Uh, and some people question the pedigree. Gun runners going this far. Gun runners are 0 for 9 and 9 furlongs. So can the horse make the distance? Is this pace setup going to be there? Um, I'll tell you why I love this horse more than anything. I think we've seen this time and time again on, on the last five Horses that won from off off more than four lengths at first call in the Kentucky Derby. All of them, when we came to the Preakness, we've seen some gun shyness there. Um, that pace that they set up in 21 seconds in the Derby was just way, way too fast that first quarter and collapsed. Um, I think we're going to see some jockeys that are a little gun shy. I think this horse is going to go early and go fast, uh, and they're going to have trouble catching him. Runs the same race that they ran in the wood. I think this is your winner. Um, he should win this race by clear lengths if he really cues up and takes a step forward. Chad loves the horse. Worked the bullet before shipping with uh, Travers third place. Travers, Travers third place finisher, Miles D. Um, ran, I like when Chad works with some of his best there. This will be my top pick. I'm very excited to see him run uh, after that Wood Memorial race where he just didn't just got too much pressure up front at the beginning. So what do you think of the uh, Derby 14th place finisher, Happy Jack? <laughs> Yeah, I like to hear the uh, positivity on early voting. Uh, I think on one of the previous videos, that was my derby horse who ended up not even going to the derby. So I think that's uh, you know, a great pick there. As far as Happy Jack, I don't think we need to spend too much time on this horse. He's pretty exposed at this point. He hasn't been within a dozen lengths of the winner and you know, basically his last four starts ever since breaking his maiden. He had a, a crazy pace to chase after in the derby and he still really couldn't manage any better than 14th. He did have to steady a little bit, had some traffic in that race, but okay, so maybe he finishes, you know, 12th or 10th instead of 14th. You know, it's to me, this is just a horse that is simply not good enough. I don't really know what they're doing with him. Um, kind of feel bad for the horse a little bit. It really needs to be dropped in class to be put in a more realistic spot. But, you know, I guess they're intent on running him, so uh, he'll go in here. Uh, I guess I will say that, you know, in a smaller field like this with a couple other horses that I'm not interested in at all, if you really like Happy Jack or you think the pace heats up, I mean, maybe he clunks up in the bottom of a superfecta. I think that's probably the extreme uppercase scenario for him, but not a horse that I'm very excited to bet. 
Let's take a look at number seven, uh, Armagnac. What'd you think of him, Andrew? So I'm a little lost here. Uh, watching all the replays over and over again, trying to figure out what's going on here. Irad picks up the mount here for uh, Tim Yakutin. Um, lost two of both. Lost to both of the Cali shippers in the SA Derby that were in the Kentucky Derby. Um, they finished way back in the Derby, and the insane figs that were coming out of California seemed to be uh, not pulling through. Uh, ran behind Happy Jack. He finished fourth in that San Diego Derby. Happy Jack ran third. Um, and he's they were noses apart. He, he almost got there, but he still finished fourth. Um, I'm fading all these California horses. The figures have not transferred to any track they've shipped to. Um, they continue to fail over and over again. I, maybe that's a Bob Baffert thing. I don't know. Um, speed figures would really need to step up here. I have the horse sitting about four off early voting, and I think the outside pressure from Epicenter is going to wear him down, and the horse is just not going to be able to make the distance. So I'm going to toss this horse even with Irad up. So what do you think about the almost derby winner Epicenter in the eighth hole? Yeah, Epicenter, he's definitely uh, the horse to beat in this race. I don't think I'm – necessarily uncovering anything uh, hidden angles by making that statement in this race. I think the big question on Epicenter is really just, if you like him, how do you bet him? He's going to be incredibly short. I'm guessing he goes off in the four to five ballpark range, maybe even money. Um, I'd be surprised if he's anything higher than that. And he probably deserves to be that short. I, mean, I think he ran the best race of anybody in the Kentucky Derby. And if you look at you know, how that race kind of unfolded, you know, your top five finishers in that race were 18th, 5th, 9th, 15th, and 17th at the first and second call, basically. Um, Epicenter was obviously the one who was fifth. So he was the one that um, uh, made a big move there and was closest to that pace before it just absolutely fell apart. He looked every bit a winner uh, turning from home. I mean, he went eye to eye with a good horse in Zandon and, you know, put that horse away, would not let him be get past. And then unfortunately, it just gets beat up the fence by a rich strike. Uh, I, I suppose if there's a reason to be a little hesitant to back up a center, it's that that's kind of twice now that we've seen him with the race that he looked to have won before getting beat by some long shot closer. I mean, it happened in the Lecomte with Call Me Midnight and then again, the Derby with Rich Strike. Um, yeah, maybe that's just a coincidence and not worth caring about. I, I do think Epicenter is the class and a talent of the field. He very much asserted that he does not need the lead in that Kentucky Derby effort. He was inside of horses. He took a little bit of kickback. I mean, not a problem for him whatsoever. So I'm not worried about him from a pace perspective or anything else. I imagine he probably lets early voting go to the lead. And then he probably takes up a tracking position just to the outside. You know, Rosario gets all the options that he wants from that post. So I definitely think he's the horse to beat. It's just a question of what price do you want to take? I think that takes us to the final horse in the field, Skippy Longstocking. I think if we're rating him on names, he'd be my pick. But what do you think of him on form? Um, I actually like this long shot here. Skippy Longstocking gets the far outside. Horse ships from New York for Safi. Uh, junior in his new home in Florida, full-time in Florida, comes up for the mount. Third in the Wood Memorial and a long shot in this race that interests me a lot. Um, the horse doesn't have to step too much. It's too far forward on its figures. Uh, it's going to be closing into the pace. Um, gets the outside poach, which for a stalker closer run style can help, especially if he takes that Sonny Leon left-hand turn, goes to the rail and saves all the ground he can. Um, it's not a 20 horse field here this time, but definitely horse is going to step back, save a little bit of ground um, and make that one big run there. Uh, needs a little bit of a fast pace in front of him. I don't know, again, who's every, all going to go. I know that early voting is definitely going to go and he's going to be out pretty far in front in my opinion. Um, but Skippy has the opportunity to come up here and run underneath at 20 to one. It's one I'm, I'm going to be using across all my uh, trifectas here. Um, so that's our field of nine this coming Saturday, going one and three sixteenths of a mile down in Baltimore at Pimlico for the big party, 7 p.m. post time. Um, I'm going to talk about my plays here. I'm epicenter, just like in the Derby. Um, I'm not going to play anybody that's too short. I'm going to look for some value here. I think epicenter is going to be shorter than short, and he deserves to be. Uh, but I'm going to take a little bit of a, a bigger swing here with a trifecta. I'm going to have early voting on top as a single. And I'm going to have 1489 over 1489 underneath. Simplification, Secret Oath, Epicenter, and Skippy Longstocking. So I'm going to play that 5 over 1489 over 1489. I really think early voting is going to get to the lead here and keep going. I think that gun shyness of the jockeys is definitely going to show as the pattern continues to repeat itself. And I think there's an opportunity here for 
uh, Jose to go wire to wire. And uh, he might be holding on by a breath, but I think that gun runner talk that everybody keeps talking about, it's 0 for 9, but it's time for it to be broken. So I'm going to be on early voting, setting the pace, and going wire to wire. Where'd you land here, Caleb? Yeah, so I think I feel the same way as you about Epicenter. He is very much the horse to beat in this race. But I think the price for me is just going to be a little bit too short to really want to do too much with him. And I do think he could be maybe slightly vulnerable. He didn't really improve as much as you would have expected on figures going into that Kentucky Derby. He has been relatively, you know, well campaigned this year. He's got a lot of starts. And I'm just wondering if maybe he's due to, you know, be a little bit tired and not show up with his best effort at a very short price, even though I acknowledge he's the horse to beat here. So instead, I'm going to the number four, Secret Oath. I liked her in the Arkansas Derby. I hated the ride she got that day. She was way too far back, and she got into some trouble, got into some traffic, and then still made an eye-catching move before flattening out late. I think the jockey upgrade to Luis Saez made a huge difference as we saw the result in the Kentucky Oaks. I love the fact that Saez just kind of gets this horse, I think, a, a great horse for him to have. And I think people have the wrong idea about her. I think people tend to think she's a, a one-run closer that's going to be, you know, in the back of the pack and whatever else. And if you look at her form, you know, in her last seven races, you know, seven of her eight career races, you know, she was within two and a half lengths of the lead at the second call. And most of those races, she's within a length. It's not like she's coming from eight or 10 lengths off the pace here. She, she's very much a stalker. She gets an aggressive jockey that I think is going to be able to be a good judge of the pace and keep her close enough. You know, I have no doubts about her getting the distance whatsoever. And I think she just sort of makes some sense in here. She will need a little bit of a, I won't say help, but, you know, she'd be stand to benefit from an honest pace for someone like Armagnac or perhaps Fenwick or even Epicenter to go out there and duel with early voting or at least do enough to keep them honest. I think she'd be up against it if anyone gets a very loose lead in here. But I think that she's just as good as the boys and she gets some weight in here and she's going to be my pick, uh, Secret Oath, uh, give one to coach. I'd love to see him. I saw the video of him getting off the horse. He was on the horse this morning, galloping her around, jogging her wrong way one time. I mean, just he's still out there ponying the horse. Love to see it at his age. It's something that's uh, really special. So we'll move on to the second segment here. We're going to look at uh, the Black Eyed Susan uh, Preakness Daily Double. Um, this pool has been pretty good in the past, and I think you can derive some value here. Um, so I'll start off by just going through my plays quickly. Um, I'm going to focus on two separate bets here, one narrow and heavy, and the second spread and fishing. My first, first, my three fillies in the Black Eyed Susan will be one, the latecomer to the scene, Miss Yearwood. Lep takes the mount for Ian Wilkes, 21, 20 to one on the morning line, which I suspect, I suspect will get bet down. Uh, the Phillies been working huge in the morning, and with Secret Oath out, with Secret Oath not in this field, it's the fourth highest speed figure out here for the ladies. I think the pace will be fast and busy up front with four horses going to the lead. Um, sits the trip and gets a late kick from, from that stalking position. Has been working really well. Fired a bullet this morning, uh, this week. Um, this is going to be one of my three I'm going to be using my daily double. Second one's Candy Light, 20-1 to 1 on the morning line. Charlie Marquez gets the mount for Grand Motion. Horse has been moved from turf to dirt uh, after its first two starts. That was a huge change. Big step forward. Finished second behind Luna Bella, the best horse in Maryland right now. Um, motion has been hot as hell coming into this race, winning last week. Um, two stakes races. I think this horse steps forward, and there's a good opportunity here, especially after that last race finishing behind Luna Bella. And the last filly I'll be using is the one I just mentioned, Luna Bella, 9-2 on the morning line. The Maryland bred has done nothing wrong, 4-4 four four in 2022, and steps forward each time. Moves to 1-1-8 one for the first time, stretching out a little bit. Figs, Figs put the horse in the range that, that I would definitely think can carry the distance. Margin of victory tells me that the added distance shouldn't be an issue as much. My two daily doubles here are going to be quite simple. Um, 368 over the 189 for one unit, and then 368 over that five early voting 10 times. So I'm going to leverage myself a little bit when I'm going to early voting, but I'm going to fish for those prices just in case something happens here. Um, so that, that'll be my daily double, 368 over the 189, and then for one time, and then 368 over the five 10 times. This Black Eyed Susan, I have to say, is one of the hardest races I've handicapped in quite some times. Uh, I think there's 13 horses, and six of them could probably win. Um, so it, it should be an interesting race, and I definitely want some value here. Uh, what would you think of this daily double? Yeah, I thought it was a tough pool to really get a handle on for me because I, I do respect Epicenter in the Preakness like we talked about. I, I think he's going to be really, really short. So it, that makes it a little bit tougher to use him plus any of the shorter prices in here, I think. 
I'm not interested in either a manner. She's the morning line favorite here. And I, I guess the favorite that most likely the post-time favorite, she doesn't do much for me, but, but I really struggled to come up with any horse that I really had a strong opinion on here. I was interested in distinctly possible the number seven, which is a horse that normally would not be a horse. I'm going to gravitate towards, you know, going from maiden company into a grade two, but you know, this is a horse that, you know, is out by Chad Brown. And it's such a unique placement for him that I, I kind of have to take a glance. I mean, he, Chad is a horse that very meticulously spots his horses. I mean, he passed on the Kentucky Derby with early voting because he liked the Preakness spot better. I mean, there's not many connections that are going to pass a race like that. And, you know, Chad's very deliberate when placing horses. So if, if he thinks this filly is good enough to run the Black Eyed Susan, after breaking her maiden, then I tend to trust him. And he has had some success with this move before with three-year-old fillies on the dirt who broke their maiden last out going into graded stakes. You know, over the past five years, he's four for 12. So 33%, uh, pretty good record. He gets Irad on board. And you know, that last race, despite being a maiden, came back pretty lively where the runner-up, Miss Yearwood, came back to absolutely annihilate a maiden field at Churchill in her next start. So for me, you know, not really wanting to take, you know, a short price or a very short price in here. And I do feel like there's quite a bit of speed signed on. It's a big 13 horse field and I can see at least three or four that probably want the lead. My pick here would be uh, distinctly possible, probably on the top side. I'm going to double into Secret Oaths, you know, and a couple others that I would probably look to include in here would be the likes of uh, Begin, number five horse coming up from Oaklawn. I thought she ran a great race. And the fantasy last out, just beaten by Yagiri, who went on to have a, you know, lost a speed battle in the Oaks to Echo Zulu, but not uh, an embarrassment by any stretch. And then uh, Radio Days, I thought was a little bit interesting. You know, on the stretch out here, she has a couple races uh, earlier this year at Aqueduct and Gulfstream that would make her a huge player in here if she can get back to them. Not really sure what happened in her last two starts. She kind of just didn't show up with the same efforts that we've grown accustomed to her uh, showing up with so far, but you, know, you get Rosario on board and she gets a stretch out here, should have a lot of pace to run after. So she's probably the other one I'd be interested in. So for me, it's going to be a double using uh, Begin, Distinctly Possible, and Radio Days with Secret Oath. So I have to ask you, Radio Days is a gun runner, correct? Yes. So 0 for 9 at, the, at these distances, what do you think? Do you think the gun runners can get the distance? Yeah, I mean, for me, a sample size of nine is not enough to get me to go run away from a horse based on pedigree. I do have questions about the distance, but I sort of think that with radio days, the questions are sort of baked into the price I'm getting at 12 to one. Even if she does take a little bit more money than that, I think that, uh, you know, that's sort of baked into the, the price that she gets. She's not going to be, you know, favorite or second choice in this field. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I, I am concerned about the distance for both radio days and early voting, to be honest, but uh it's not so much to really talk me off a horse at 12 to 1. I love that. I couldn't agree more. So this coming Friday to Saturday is that Black Eyed Susan Preakness Daily Double. Post time, 5.44 p.m. Race number 13 at Pimlico this Friday. Black Eyed Susan Phillies going one and one-eighth of a mile in that dirt down there. Um, then we'll have followed up by the Preakness that Saturday, as I said before. Um, 7, 7 o'clock p.m., one and three-sixteenths of a mile. And Pimlico again, that big party that's going on. Caleb, it's a pleasure. Hopefully we get some winners this time. Um, and uh, we'll be seeing you guys back for the Belmont in a couple weeks.